just entered the room. Hello, young Hello. sir. We're so glad you're with us. All right. Today we have Bob Canagas, and I messed up his name. No, I got it right. I got it right. You got it right. He is he's gonna enthrall and and engage and entertain us with magnificent stories today. And without further ado, what, what is an ado? Is the opposite of a do or don't? But anyhow, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Bob Canagas. Hey, thank you, Bob C. Thank you, uh, Luis. You're the people I can see. And for those I can't see, I've, <laughs> I've just got to imagine you. I am here in just the outskirts of Albuquerque, New Mexico, in the Rio Grande Valley. Last night, a big wind came through. It shook the house in the middle of the night. I woke up. It was about 20 degrees colder than usual. So I always like to tell stories particularly around a campfire. I'm going to ask everybody to help me warm up a little bit, warm yourselves up. This is the way I like to start most of my storytelling programs. So imagine we've been out in the woods. We've got some tinder and some kindling. We're going to spark the fire the old-fashioned way by rubbing a couple of sticks together. Those sticks, everybody, are your hands. So I'm going to imagine now if, that you're going to do this with me. Rub your hands together until they get really nice and warm. When you can feel the heat, send the heat to the fire that's right in front of us. And watch first that white smoke curl up. And then the sparks go up into the night sky. Here in North America, we're looking at the winter sky now, or the beginning of the winter sky. So I would see Orion up there. Rub your hands together one more time. Get them really nice and warm. And again, when you can feel the heat, put your hands on your heart. And remember that all of us, wherever we are all around the world, are human beings with beating hearts. And I hope you're feeling warm-hearted first towards yourself and then towards each other. So I call that uh, supporting global warming. Oh, uh, global heartwarming. So thank you for supporting global heartwarming. I've got my blinds closed right now because the light is in front of me. But if I opened up the blinds, I would be looking at the Sandia Mountains. Sandia is Spanish for watermelon. The watermelon mountains, because of the way they look when the sun is going down. They rise about 11,000 feet or about 3,300 meters up into the air. And then right across the valley, close enough for me to walk in about 10 minutes, is the Rio Grande River and, and the forest there. Now, I'm telling you this because this is where I go and walk, clear my head, sometimes early in the morning and sometimes late at night. It was just about a month ago that I was sitting in the kitchen getting ready to cook a little bit of dinner when my wife Liz ran in and started yelling and screaming, they're here, they're here, our visitors are back. And I was thinking, did we invite any visitors for dinner tonight? And then I knew exactly what she meant. Because every fall, right about the beginning of November, hundreds and then thousands of birds called sandhill cranes come flying here to New Mexico, some of them all the way from Alaska, where I used to live. Then they spend, they spend the winter here. So I can go down to what we call the Bosque on any evening now and watch the cranes come in. They've been flying around and looking for food all day, and they come in to spend the night at the winter, the, the, the night at the river. I'm going to try, I'm going to try and share my screen for just a moment so you can see what these birds look like. Hopefully this will work. So I'm going to try and share the screen now. Let's see how that works. Uh, the host is not letting me do that. Ollie, can you let me share my screen? Yeah, my friend. Anyway. Okay. I'll try again. Uh, and if not, I'm going to just move on. Would like you oh, to no, see. Ali's good at this. Just give him a uh, moment. Okay. He's good at this. So. Oh, I think he may have to grant you. Um, they are. Well, while, while we're waiting, I'll just tell you that can, they are. Can you try now, please? Okay, here we go. Let's try it. Here we go. And we'll try this. 
So, yeah, can you, can you see? this is a picture I took of the cranes, uh, the last full moon flying in front of the moon. And then there they are. You can see the, the beautiful redheads. Here's a, uh, so I'm going to just uh, stop that screen share right now. Just you've got a, you've had an idea just to give you an idea of how big they are. Here's here's a feather. Here we go. And it's about half just the feathers, half the length of my arm. Whoa. OK, so I'm telling you about this because I want to tell you a story that comes from Alaska. The uh, the Yupik people of Alaska tell this story. And I love it because I used to live there and I'd see the cranes in Alaska. And now that I live in New Mexico, every fall, I see the birds come down. I get to see these birds in the fall and then when they leave in the spring. So, once upon a time, there was a crane who woke up by the banks of the Yukon River and he was hungry. Hungry for his favorite, favorite food, berries. Now this crane knew just where the best berry patches along the banks of the Yukon were. And so on that morning, he spread those great six foot wings of his, stretched out his neck, jumped up, took off, up he flew, circling the river until they spied the berry patches down below. Now Crane landed hungry, hungry, hungry for berries. He was just about to start eating some berries when an idea came to him. He thought, I really have to concentrate when I'm looking for those berries to find those small berries in the tundra when I'm looking down, I can't see behind me. What if a hunter was coming up? What if a fox was coming up and wanted to eat me? I can't see. I can't see the danger. And then he had an idea. Oh, he thought this was a great, great idea. I will just take my eyes out. And so Crane plucked his eyes out, put them on a little stump, and said, Eyes, there might be danger coming. I want you to look around for me while I'm picking berries. And if you see danger, you call me. I'll come running back. I'll put you in and we'll fly away. The eyes said, yes, master, we will tell you if there is any danger, go enjoy your berries. So Crane hopped a few feet uh, over to one side where he knew there were some beautiful crowberries. Now, crowberries are called crowberries in Alaska because they are black, black, dark, round, little spheres, the color of crows. Mm, and they are good. Crow began to eat the berries. Meanwhile, the eyes were looking around, looking around for danger. Uh, I don't see any danger, do you? No, I don't see any danger, said the other eye. They kept looking in all directions, but nothing was happening. They got bored. Oh, there's nothing to do. There's no danger, said one eye to the other. Let's play a trick on Master. Ooh, that would be a good idea, said the other eye. Yes, let's play a trick. And so together they called out, Master, Master, danger, danger, come quickly. Crane kept, Crane jumped up from what he was doing. He felt his way back to where he left the eyes. He put in one eye, he put in another eye. He looked around. No danger. All he saw was some branches just drifting in the wind. Oh, he was mad. He took his eyes out and he said, you tricked me. What did I tell you? You should only call me if there's danger. That wasn't funny. The eyes looked at each other. <laughs> they couldn't. 
<laughs> they couldn't stop laughing. I'm serious. Only call me if there's danger. Yes, master, we will only call you if there's danger. Go enjoy some berries. Now Crane hopped over in a different direction where he knew there were some wild cranberries. Oh, there's two kinds of cranberries in Alaska, the high bush cranberries and the low bush cranberries. These were the low bush cranberries, and they are better than anything I have ever had for Thanksgiving out of a can. Well, Crane was enjoying those berries. The eyes were looking around for danger, but again, no danger. Boring. Let's do it again. Then we got in trouble the last time. Oh, baby. Oh, it was so much fun, though. Let's do it. Master, master, come quickly. Danger. Crane swallowed that last berry that he was eating. He jumped back towards where he had left his eyes. He put his eyes back in. He looked around. This time, the only thing he saw was a little stick floating down the river. And this time, he wasn't just angry. He was furious. He took out his eyes, and he gave those eyes a scolding. I've told you once, and now I'm telling you twice. You are only supposed to call me when there's danger. This is not a game. Don't you ever do it again. This time, the eyes thought, we better not play that game again. Go, go enjoy some berries, Crane. We won't do it again. Crane hopped over to another patch of the tundra where he had seen beautiful blueberries growing. Now, blueberries happened to be my favorite berry. I put some blueberries in my pancakes this morning. They were called wild boreal blueberries. They were delicious. Crane was enjoying himself eating those berries. He couldn't get enough. He was eating so many berries that the juice was running down his bill. It was staining his feathers blue. He was having a wonderful time. Back on the stump, this time, there was danger. The eyes looked around. They saw an arctic fox slowly sneaking up. The eyes weren't fooled. That fox was looking right at them. In fact, that fox was saying to himself, Juicy eyeballs! Juicy eyeballs! Good to eat! Good to eat! Master, master, danger, they called. And I'm sure you already know what Crane was thinking. They're trying to play a trick on me again. I'm not coming. Master, master, it's a fox that's coming to eat us, danger. Crane just kept eating and enjoying those berries while the fox enjoyed a nice little snack of juicy eyeballs. <laughs> he swallowed those eyeballs whole. After a while, Crane was full of berries. He came back to the little stump to pick up his eyes. He felt around. No eyes. Where are my eyes? He felt around some more. His eyes were gone. He couldn't see. What was he going to do? Ah, there are berries here, he thought. I'll try some berries. Crane put one, two crowberries in his eyes. Maybe these will be good eyes, he thought. He looked around. No. Everything is dark. These eyeballs won't do. He took out the berries, and he remembered, don't waste food. He ate them up. I better look around some more. Mm. 
Mm, he felt around. He put two cranberries in his eyes. And now, that's weird. Everything looks red. Mm, that's not right. These eyes won't do. You know what he did. Mmm, good to eat. If you're following the story, I'm sure you can guess what he did next. He felt around and picked up two what? That's right, blueberries. He tried two blueberries. He looked around. He thought, wow, the sky is blue. The river is blue. The tundra is blue. Those kids over there picking berries across the river are blue. I like these eyes. I think I'll keep them. And he did. Now, the Yupik people from the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, where I used to live, say that that is how cranes got their blue eyes. I started to think about that story. You know, I've got a good set of binoculars. I can, I can look closely up at cranes, and I, I said, wait a minute. When I looked really carefully, cranes don't have blue eyes. Some kid's going to tell me that they looked closely in, into crane's eyes, and they weren't blue at all. I was, this, was just, this was just made up. Well, then I learned something really interesting. Cranes do have blue eyes. When they first come out of their shells and when their lids first open a little while later, at the very beginning, their eyes are blue. And then somehow, as they get a little bit older, their eyes change to the more yellowish color that we see. And I thought about that and I thought, wait a minute, the color of your eyes can change? That seems kind of strange. And then I thought, well, that's not so strange at all. Uh, I used to have curly blonde hair, and now I have gray hair. Something changed about me. <laughs> oh, something changed about Baba C, too. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, oh, by the way, how did I get those gray hairs? Kids had something to do with it. But that's the story of how Crane got his blue eyes. Thanks. Excellent story. Excellent. Excellent. And you mentioned uh, kids giving you gray hairs. So I, 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 I uh, co-founded a private school and one of my sons used to work with me at the school. And one day one of the kids asked me because my beard was full and was just being turned into gray and white. He said, Baba C, how did you get all, how did your beard turn gray and white? And without missing a beat, my son said he raised me. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But as for it's this, probably, that's another it's story. probably harder for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> you got other stories underneath that hat, don't you? Uh, yes, I do. I, I had to put something under there to take the place of the hair. But that was a great story. I hope you have another one you're willing to share. Well, I do. First, I uh, in the room is uh, is, is uh, Norman. So I just want to say hi, Norman. Hello, hey nice Norman. Hi, Louie. Hello, Hello. Hello. Okay. Norman's well, another uh, great fellow. I wonder, uh, just the other day I was, uh, I called my granddaughter and I had all kinds of questions to ask her. She lives in California. And I said, hey, I'm asking all the questions. Do you want to ask a question to me? And she, and she asked, she's 10. She asked, yeah, what kind of birds are there in New Mexico? And I thought, what a great, great question. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to tell a, bird, a story about birds this morning. Well, <clears throat> Other interesting things happen right outside my window here in Corrales, New Mexico. And the other night, and on many nights, I hear coyotes calling. In fact, if you drive into our town in Corrales, there's two signs when you come into Corrales. One sign says, Corrales is coyote friendly. The other sign says, uh, Drive slow, see our town. Drive fast, see our judge. <laughs> so this is <laughs> this is Corrales. So we have, but there are loads and loads of, of, 
of uh, coyotes here. And oh gosh, they they make such a an amazing, amazing variety of sounds. And sometimes it's kind of creepy. The other not not that long ago, I saw a coyote down by the mailboxes, and he had one of his neighbors, one of our neighbors' chickens in his mouth. And I thought, oh, that's terrible. And then I thought. Well, I had chicken dinner the other night. I guess uh, if I can eat chicken, so can coyotes. And that's why that's why Corrales is a little bit uh, coyote friendly. So I thought I would tell you a coyote story. Now, in New Mexico and the Pueblos, uh, close to where I live, uh, winter time and getting close to winter time is a good time for telling coyote stories. This is a, a Native American coyote story from uh, another part of the country, the Great Plains, but it's one that I love. And it was one of the very first stories that I ever heard. I heard it on, a, on an old cassette tape. And then I found a version in a book. And then over the years, I've sort of told it in a different way. So this is the story of Coyote. Coyote loved to sing. He didn't sing with a beautiful voice, but he loved, he loved the sound of his own voice. And one of the songs that he sang sounded more or less like this. And if you can translate Coyote, what that song was saying was, anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. So, this is a song that he went around singing to all the other animals. If, uh, if, if, rabbit said that, if rabbit said that he could jump high, Coyote would say, I, I can do that better. I can jump higher. You know, if Antelope said that he could run fast, Coyote would say, oh, I can do that better than, you, better than you. Anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. Now, you can probably imagine that that did not make Coyote very popular with the other animals. In fact, they gave him his name, Coyote, which meant copycat or imitator. Coyote did not like that name. And he probably didn't like that name because it was really telling the truth about him. And then one day, something incredible happened. For the first time that all the animal people could remember, they heard the voice of the Creator booming from the sky. Animal people, listen carefully. There is going to be a great, great change coming to the earth. Soon, there will be a new kind of animal, a new kind of animal person. This animal person will walk on two legs and be known as a human being. There will be many, many, many changes when the human beings, the people people, come here. I want you to all get ready. Then, Creator continued. He had exciting news. Before the big change came, he was going to let every animal choose a new name and a new power. Yes, everyone will have a chance to choose a new name. Oh, what excitement there was amongst all the animal people. Who was more excited than anyone? Coyote. This would be a chance for him to get rid of that name that he didn't like once and for all. And better than that, he was going to be able to pick a powerful name. Because the Creator continued his instructions. He said, animal people, tomorrow, when the sun first comes up, when the sun first breaks the horizon, come to the big tree in the center of the forest. Whoever arrives first, will choose the first name. Whoever arrives second will be able to choose the second name and so forth and so on until all the names are taken. 
Coyote was a powerful thinker, or so he thought. I need a plan. I've got to be the first one to the tree. I've got to be sure that no one gets there before me because I want the most powerful name. How was he going to do that? He thought, he thought some more. Ah, he thought, simple. I won't go to sleep tonight. I'll build a fire close to the tree. I'll stay up all night and I'll be there before anyone else is. Everyone will be asleep, and I will already be at the tree. Now, he commanded, because this is how he was, he commanded his wife and his children to gather firewood. He wasn't thinking about what they might become or who they might choose to be. All he was thinking about how it was that he would get that powerful name. He barked at them, go get wood for me. Coyote's wife, who the next morning would take her own name, she had decided to become Mole, said, Coyote, if you want a fire, you build it yourself. Also, she was a little bit afraid that Coyote might try to get too powerful a name, and she really didn't want to help him do that. Because she knew if he got that powerful name, he might be even more trouble than he already was. So Coyote built a little fire, just like we did at the beginning of our session. He built a fire. Let's, let's, let's build that fire for Coyote again. We'll just send the heat to his fire. Here we go. And now Coyote was sitting in front of a beautiful blazing fire thinking, oh, who shall I be? What name shall I ask for in the morning? And he thought, oh, I know. I will ask to be Grizzly Bear, the most powerful of all the animals that walk the earth. Yes, tomorrow I'll be Grizzly Bear. And then another thought came, came to him, but maybe Maybe it would be great to fly. I'll ask to be the most powerful flyer. I will ask Creator to change my name to Eagle. Yes, tomorrow I'll be Eagle. And yet his mind was still divided. He thought, what would it like to be a, a great and powerful swimmer? Who could I be in the water? Ah, I'll be Salmon, the great jumper, the great traveler, the great journeyer. I will be Salmon. So as Coyote sat by the fire, he began to chant to himself, Tomorrow I'll be Grizzly Bear or Eagle or Salmon. Tomorrow I'll be Grizzly Bear or Eagle or Salmon. I can't see you. I probably can't hear you. But let's try and do this together. Tomorrow I'll be Grizzly Bear or Eagle or Salmon. Tomorrow I'll be Grizzly Bear or Eagle or Salmon. Oh, through the night, Coyote repeated this chant over and over, trying to make up his mind. Well, then he noticed that he was beginning to get a little bit tired. Staying up all night is not as easy as it sounds. His eyelids were beginning to droop a little bit. The energy was going out of his singing and he thought, oh no, I can't let myself fall asleep. But as always, he got a wonderful idea. He thought, I'm going to take my glasses off for this. He looked in front of him. He found two little twigs just about this size. He thought, I'll know what I can do so that my eyes won't close. Now don't do this at home. He opened up one eye and he propped up a stick in his upper eyelid and secured it in his lower eyelid until that stick was holding his left eye open and then the other stick was holding his right eye open. And now there was Coyote with his eyes wide open 
Now you can kind of imagine yourself doing this. Let's do it again. Tomorrow I'll be grizzly bear or eagle or salmon. Tomorrow I'll be grizzly bear or eagle or salmon. Tomorrow I'll be... Coyote was sleeping with his eyes wide open. Coyote was sleeping when the sun came up. Coyote was sleeping as a parade of animals came to ask for their new names. And then when the sun was already quite high in the sky, <coughs> Coyote woke up. He took the sticks out of his eyes. He was sure that uh, it was still early in the day. He ran a few feet to the tree. He called up. Great spirit, creator, it is me, Coyote, and I am here for my new name. And I have decided to ask for the name Grizzly Bear. Oh, Coyote was smiling, thinking about the change that was about to come. But creator called down, Coyote. The name of Grizzly Bear was the first name to be taken this morning. You are going to have to choose another name. And at that, Coyote's tail drooped down beneath his legs. And now I'm going to ask you to do this with me too, because Coyote is going to cry. And when coyotes cry, they stretch their necks. So, Baba C, Luis, I can see you. Can you stretch your necks? There we go. And when coyotes howl, they stick out their tongues and pant. <laughs> That's it. And they scratch their fleas. <laughs> and now Coyote was crying. No! Oh, oh, oh. And then he thought, well, that's okay. I have a backup plan. Creator, it is fine. I will be very happy. Give me the name Eagle. I will be the great powerful flyer. And of course, you know that the name of Eagle had already been taken. You will have to ask again, Coyote. Coyote's tail drooped. He cried. All right, everybody, heads up. Tongues out. Scratch your fleas and howl. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I have a backup plan of my backup plan, creator. I choose the name. What was the third name? Salmon. I will be the great swimmer, Salmon. Coyote called down Great Spirit. You slept too late. You were not prepared to meet me. All the names have been given. There is only one name left to choose. That shall be your name. And I bet everybody listening knows what that name was. Your name shall continue to be Coyote. <laughs> Coyote was just about to begin crying again when Great Spirit spoke a last time and said, Coyote, you are in much trouble. Just as the human beings who are coming will be much trouble. But just as they are trouble, they are, are also smart and interesting. And you are smart and you have a good brain if you use it well. Coyote, I'm going to give you the, a very special power. It is the power to survive. You will be a survivor, Coyote. Your kind will always be here. You will always be here to remind the human beings about how foolish they can be and how smart they can be. Perhaps they will learn a lesson from you, Coyote. That will be your job here. And as we know, uh, coyotes do survive. For years and years, uh, people have tried to eradicate coyotes, seeing them as pests. But coyotes always survive. I am so glad they're here. I am so glad that we have the stories of coyotes. I hope uh, 
I hope that you have heard some other ones and will continue to tell them. Thank you. Another great story. I love it. You know, Coyote is uh, part of the Pathanon of tricksters. Of course, you know that. That's Coyote, right. uh, Monkey, uh, Anansi the Spider, you know, they're all tricksters. And uh, I love Coyote stories because they have to use their wits to survive, you know. And you're right. Um, Americans have been trying to eradicate coyotes for years under the erroneous assumption that they were detrimental to the environment, but right. they're part of the ecosystem, you know. So that's a great story. I like yeah, that. Thank you. Exactly. And uh, uh, oh, and fox. Fox is also a trickster. Fox is a trickster. Turtles a trickster. Rabbits a trickster. Guinea pigs a right. trickster. Ravens a trickster. By, by the way, in case you don't know, on Fridays Louis has swim. So he stays with us and then uh, he travels, uh, he takes us with him uh, on the way to swim. So sometimes we can see him and sometimes we can't. So I just want you to know he's not being rude. He's just That's, on the way to swim. Yeah, uh, and I will be on the way to swim uh, shortly after the program ends. Uh, I'm glad I'll I have be a on the way to lunch. So, uh, Bob, say, how are we doing on time? Um, it is now, let's see, wait. You're in New Mexico, so are you on on Pacific time or? Well, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in Mountain time, but how are we doing in, in terms of time oh, for? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Uh, on my on my side, it's one thirty seven. So you have about you have you have a few more minutes. You have enough time for another story. All right, let's do uh, let's let's do let's do one more. I'm, I guess I'm telling animal. I guess I'm telling animal stories this morning. Animal I was thinking, stories are great. Uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, what story? Ah, okay. Uh, I love old books, and the other day I found uh, uh, I found an old picture book, and in it I made a copy of one page. I don't know if you can read this, but it, can you read that? How to sleep through the winter. Winter. How to sleep yes. through the winter. So these are all pictures of bears. Uh, it's find a comfortable cave. Make sure it's vacant or empty. Put in a good supply of firewood. Stock up on goodies and snacks. Be sure the bed is comfortable and set the clock for spring. So, of course, this is the time of year. This is the time of year that the bears are hibernating. So there's an old Appalachian folktale. Many of you will be familiar with it. But, you know, uh, something like that happened right here in New Mexico. Because once a long time ago, there was a there was a family. There was a there was a grandmother a grandfather and a little granddaughter that all lived together in a little cabin way up in northern new mexico in the woods and they also had a little pet chipmunk and one day it was about this time of year grandma said you know it's, it's just about time to cook biscuit cheetos biscuit cheetos are sugar cookies uh with cinnamon and anise that everybody in new mexico loves but she told granddaughter, I, I don't have any, any sugar. Could you go down, take this dollar, go down to the store and see if uh, you could buy a pound of sugar for the man in the store. So the little girl said, yes, I will, grandmother. But just before she left, Granny said, remember, though, that the bears are hibernating right now. When you pass Bear's Cave, whatever you do, don't wake the bear. And the little girl said, don't worry, I wouldn't do that. So she opened the door and she went down the down the path and she went over a bridge. She passed Bear's Cave, didn't say a word, went into the store, bought a pound of sugar, was on her way back and stopped at Bear's Cave. She looked in the cave. She called in, oh, Stumpy Tail, oh, Stumpy Tail, are you in there? Are you awake? And the bear came out, rubbed his eyes, and said, I'm in here. I was sleeping. I haven't had anything to eat since I went in my cave, and I'm hungry. I'm going to eat you. And gobbled that little girl right up. Gobbled that girl up and her pound of sugar. Grandmother was waiting with grandfather and the little pet chipmunk back at the house. And when granddaughter, granddaughter didn't come back, she said to Grandpa, Grandpa, you better go down to the store and see what happened to Granddaughter. Why isn't she back? I'm a little bit worried. 
And I don't have to tell you, you're a grown-up. Whatever you do, let's all say it together. Don't let the bear. bear. Yeah. And she, you know what Grandpa said? Oh, I wouldn't do that. So Grandpa opened the door, went out the house, down the path, over the bridge, past Bear's Cave, into the store, asked about his granddaughter. The man in the store said, well, she was here just about an hour ago. I gave her the sugar. I don't know where she went. Maybe she's on her, already on her way back home. Maybe you just missed her. Grandpa went out of the store, went through the woods, and stopped at Bear's Cave. He stuck his head in the cave. He sniffed it and said, Hey, it smells like stale beer around here. Are you awake? Oh, said the bear. I was sleeping. You woke me up. I'm hungry. I ate your little granddaughter, and now I'm going to eat you. He did. Gobbled grandfather right now. Now, grandmother was really worried. She said to herself, Granddaughter didn't come back. Grandfather didn't come back. If you want a job done right, you just have to do it yourself. So I'll just go and see what happened. Well, she was wearing her old house dress, and she thought, if I'm going to the store, I want to make myself pretty. So she put on her best dress, put on a couple of earrings, some eye makeup, some lipstick. She looked in the mirror and said, looking good. Out the house she went. Out the house, down the path, across the bridge, past Bear's Cave, into the store. She asked about her grand, her, her granddaughter and grandpa. The store owner was a little bit baffled. He says, I don't know. They, they, they were here. Gave the sugar to your granddaughter. Grandpa was here a while ago. Don't know what happened. Well, if you want a job done right, you got to do it yourself. Grandma headed back to look for her family, but she stopped at Bear's Cave. Now, she's not going to bother the bear, is she? Hey! 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 Lumpy fur! Oh, bear, are you in there? Are you awake? She was teasing the bear, too. The bear came out. You woke me up. I'm hungry. Hey, little girl, little sugar. I ate your husband, old grandpa, and now I'm going to eat this foolish, foolish old grandmother. And bear gobbled her up. Now, there's someone left at the, at the house, right? Who's left? The little pet squirrel. Now that little pet squirrel loved her family. She loved her, her, her uh, uh, the little chipmunk, loved her family. She, she loved her chipmunk babies, but she loved her human family too. She wondered what happened to granddaughter and grandpa and grandma. So the little squirrel just squirreled out of the house. The little chipmunk went down the path over the bridge past Bear's Cave, into the store. See, I can, I can talk coyote and chipmunk. And uh, that, of course, meant, where is everybody? The store owner told the story of uh, everyone coming for the sugar and asking about each other, didn't know. And the little chipmunk ran out of the store and right to the mouth of the cave. Now, I don't know what the chipmunk said, but I think that she went in just far enough and pulled a couple of hairs from the bear's ear. Oh, you woke me up. I ate a little girl. I ate an old grandpa, a foolish woman, and now I'm going to eat you, said the bear. But chipmunk did not wait around to be eaten. Out the cave, she went up a tree. The bear followed. Out to the end of a small little branch, 
went the chipmunk and jumped across to the next tree. When Bear tried to follow, the tree gave way. He was too heavy and down, down, down in a spiral or a circle or a belly flop. Down landed the bear right on that big belly. When he landed, he landed so hard that he split wide open. Out came Grandma, and her lipstick wasn't even messed up. Out came Grandpa, as foolish as ever. Out came the little girl, granddaughter, holding her pound of sugar. They went home safe and sound. Grandma baked those biscuitos, but while they were in the oven, she raced back and found that bear and used her sewing needle and did a wonderful job of sewing that bear up and thought, you know, why shouldn't the bear enjoy a little midwinter snack? She invited the bear over for Biscuit Cheetos too. The bear ate a big, big pawful and went back to sleep and hopefully had a wonderful, wonderful winter of sweet, sweet dreams. And that's the story that I call Don't Wake the Bear. Well, thank you, everyone. That was great. I love your stories. They're so diverse. Uh, and, and there was animals in each of them. So um, I like that. And I also like how the chipmunk had to use its wits and its brains to overcome uh, the challenge at hand. So, yeah, that was great. Well, I don't know, well, you know, I don't know about pulling, a, pulling, pulling an ear hair out of bear is like the smartest thing to do. But, you know... Uh, maybe that chipmunk was really confident. And, and it was an eerie thing to do, see, pulling out the... the it was an oh, it was eerie. Thing. Yeah, it was eerie. But uh, but I'm, I'm quite sure he heard the bear roar. And that was must, must have been a grisly affair. Okay, I'm going to stop. Oh, no, I got one last one. If they had a camera, it would have been a Kodiak moment. Oh, my goodness. Oh, man. You're showing your age. Uh, That's all right. There's only one way not to get old. Hey, I, I, used to live, I used to live quite close to Kodiak in, uh, uh, in Alaska, and I have been just fortunate enough to, uh, to have had many, many encounters with, with bears, black bears Safe and green bears. And, and I am so glad that we have, I just want to say, I'm just so glad that we still have wild animals uh on the planet and uh i hope that we will continue to take care so that the children who are listening and their children and grandchildren will live in a world where there are bears and coyotes and chipmunks and all kinds of creatures. No, 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 no. in washington dc we have a, we have wild animals we're trying to get rid of they're called politicians but that's another story um oh i got a little business to wrap up, but Got a little business to take care okay. of. Okay. Well, again, everybody, thank you. I'm Bob Canada here in Mexico. All right. It was great. And look forward to seeing you and participating. Oh, am I muted? No. I look forward to. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I look forward to to hear uh, to seeing you, experiencing you again, uh, along with Norman, and of course, King Louis. But first, <laughs> oh, I got to say this. Uh, tomorrow morning. We're going to be um, 11 a.m. UK time. That's 5 a.m. my time. We're going to have Asian and Australasian tellers. Please join us this Sunday, 6 p.m. UK time. Rock the cash bar. Please invite friends and people to uh, come and attend. And if possible, make a donation toward the upcoming Marrakesh International Storytelling Festival in February of 22. Then Yay. Tuesday, of course, we have our big, our most favorite event, and that will be at 4.30 UK time. We moved it up a little bit because in parts of Asia, the young ones that join us, it's like 11 or 10 o'clock at night, and they have school in the morning. So we're going to have the international young college, <laughs> 18 or younger. You're more than welcome. And those of us who are more seasoned shall listen, and after the young tellers uh, <laughs> interact with each other, we can share our encouragements. And I think that takes us to next Friday. Um, Pauline uh, Coroner, Coroner, Coroner. Yes, does Pauline Cora? 
Right. She is going to have stories. And that Saturday at 6 p.m., that's on the 18th, we're going to have Rona Babor's Christmas special. And <laughs> that Sunday on the 19th, uh, Worldwide Storytelling Round will be back. It's like open mic for all storytellers. And John Rowe may be back with us. John Rowe, by the way, is um, is doing programs here and there and everywhere. So he's uh, unable to be with us today. But I'm, you know what? I think when he sees us on, what do you call it, the playback, uh, I think he's going to be uh, very, very pleased with, uh, with the storytelling and the audience as well. Louie, go swimming, but I have a challenge for you. Can you get in the water without getting wet? <laughs> ah, does a weird sweating reaction now because I just I just did already and I saw my coach Ben in the car and I don't know it says ready in a car. No All right. it's, no, it's really in the car. No. No. Annoying. Oh. <laughs> uh, oh, Mom, wait a minute. Yeah. Um no he's no Get out and I just just waiting and I'm gonna leave leave you obviously and that's one. Um well, well Louie, we'll see you next Friday. And I'm wishing Friday, you a wonderful Friday, yeah. Yes. When I will wish you a wonderful weekend and a great swim. Norman is always my friend, it's always good to see and to hear you. Bob, I can't <laughs> wait to experience you again. Um, I'm Baba C stepping in for John Rowe. Uh, yeah. And on that note, everyone, have a good evening, have a good afternoon, whatever you have, have a good one. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. bye. All right, take, take care, care, everybody. Take Today's care. program bye. was brought to you by Creativity. Hey, <laughs> hey, um, Ali, thank you so much, man. I thank you. Was able, I was actually able to admit somebody to the program, so I'm feeling good about that. So that was great. <laughs> That was great. I thought you could just leave it in the car. Mom, mom, mom. Go, 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 go. <laughs> Later, Louis. Later, Louis, mom. As bye always, bye. Ali, thank you for. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for negotiating the, um, so the, the magic carpet. And well mom, done. Thank you, sir. I, 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 I loved your storytelling. And, I, and with your permission, I may borrow and adapt a couple of your stories. That's what the, what the stories are out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So on that note, um, right. happy holidays, everybody. Yeah. And stay we'll, well. See you next time. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you continued. so much. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, Ali. Ali. Thank you, Hachum Vicky. Ah, Sikitu, Sikitu. You're welcome. And Missouri <laughs> Zana. Very well done. All right. Thank so you. I'm signing out. And you, what time is it where you are, Ali? It's uh, 8 o'clock. And the PM side, right? Yeah, it's PM. Yeah, yeah it's about to be 2 o'clock here. I think I'm going for a late lunch. Okay. But um, have, take care. Will you, oh, you'll be um, with us tomorrow morning? Yes, for sure. Okay. Um, um, uh, five No, wait. My time is 5 o'clock. Your time is what? Um, 10 o'clock? 10 o'clock, yeah, it's 10 o'clock. In the morning, okay. So I will sign on probably about 4.50 just to make sure everything is up and running. Yeah. Okay, and uh, okay, I'm excited about that. I won't get any sleep until Monday. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. All right. And okay. Uh, you have a wonderful smile, my friend. Wonderful Thank you, smile. my friend. Thank, Thank you, you so and take care. And I'm going to try to be quiet so you can sign us out. <laughs>